Welcome to the Capstone Conversation, where you learn about what's happening in the greater East Bay. I am your host, Jared Ash. I am joined by Matt Francois, a council member, mayor, planning commissioner, transportation commissioner, and land use attorney in the city of Walnut Creek. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, Jared. Anything else you want to share about your background and introduce yourself to the audience? Part of my credentials I would want to include is I'm a proud father to two college-age children, Caroline and Andrew, and a loving husband to Samantha, and happy to be a resident of Walnut Creek for almost 25 years now. He's also an avid marathon runner. We were talking about how busy people stay really busy. And he managed to squeeze that in. I think since I've had three kids, I can't keep up with that anymore. It can be challenging for sure, but I find that it's a really helpful form of stress relief. And th those long runs when you're out on the Iron Horse Trail and can just zone out, like get some miles in, it feels really good afterwards. We want to dive in and talk about economic development and land use. What I like about your background is there's a lot of council people who've come from planning commissions or other commissions, not just in Walnut Creek, but throughout the Tri-Valley, Contra Costa, Solano region, but there's also um, people who don't know much about land use and how it ties into economic development. I want to start with, give us an overview of how do you see land use as an economic development tool? It's a great question, and I've practiced land use law as an attorney for the last 25 years in private practice, representing developers, property owners, applicants in seeking approvals for residential, commercial, industrial projects throughout the state. And the trend that I've seen is that it's really key to not just be focused on what the general plan or the zoning allows, the process, how you get there really matters. That's where having folks either through the chamber, outside the city or inside the city in terms of an economic development uh, department, working very closely with the planning department to convey the importance of time and money because to an applicant, those two items are critical. While it may seem you know innocuous on its face that you need a use permit or a rezoning, the key from the applicant standpoint is to have some assurances that entitlement will be granted at the end of the day and that they can get that entitlement in a relatively straightforward and timely manner. The two really work hand in a healthy, I think, uh, municipality or local government agency. And certainly that's what we're striving for in Walnut Creek. Let's talk about that a little bit. I just got to attend a meeting of, I think, 14, 15 commercial brokers that the Chamber of Walnut Creek put on. A lot of the brokers were talking about that time to permits and how that hurts people. It was really that time and then the acknowledgement of, hey, if you do A, B, and C, you'll get your permit. But then, oh, wait, you did A, B, and C, but now you need to do Q. RS. Can you right. talk a little bit about those and how some of that really impacts business owners and how that can be improved within a city? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Part embedded in that question is the need for cities, including Walnut Creek, to do a comprehensive deep dive into their codes and really do an examination from a policy standpoint. Is it really necessary that we require a use permit or some sort of discretionary approval for any particular use? Thinking of things that as innocuous as putting an ATM on the side of, a, of an, an existing office building or converting office to medical office, things of that nature, or moving to biotech or flex space. It's, it's incumbent on cities, including Walnut Creek, to do, do that hard work in terms of, let's look at our codes, which were written 10, 20 years ago and find out, is this permit really needed? Or can we achieve our policy objectives through some other means? And if it's not needed, let's get rid of the permit requirement. But assuming the permit is needed, state law has provided a pretty good groundwork for this in terms of the, the Permit Streamlining Act and recent changes that have been made to state law 
And the Permit Streamlining Act puts a shot clock on a city's uh, requirement to process a permit. The complicating factor is that the shot clock doesn't start running until environmental review has been completed. There's technically a shot clock on that, but it's hard to enforce. There's things that need to be done at the state level to, to streamline the process. And I think it could be helpful if all cities were on a level playing field and it's done at a state level. But what, what the state's also done is they've put a shot clock on building gradings and demolition permits. Right now, that shot clock only applies to housing projects. I'm challenging myself and my colleagues. Let's put those shot clocks on any type of permit. It sh we really shouldn't be drawing these distinctions. We should be striving to have this customer service mentality for any type of project that comes in the door and process it as quickly as we possibly can. What do you think from a policy perspective the state can do to help cities streamline that process throughout California? That's a difficult one because there's so many different competing policy objectives that the state is dealing with right now. Their focus has almost uh, singularly seemed to be on housing. And we see just this last year, there were more than 30 housing bills passed and signed into law by the governor, ranging from dealing with changing the timing in which uh, fees have to be paid for a housing project or extending housing approvals to clarifying and changing the rules on Builders remedy projects that an, uh, a developer can propose in a city that doesn't have a certified housing element, and those projects typically don't comply with planning and zoning requirements. I think the state could take a broader view at this. They've been really focused on the housing component of it. One could argue to the neglect of big picture insurance issues that the state is dealing with, but also high office vacancy rates. There was one bill this year, office conversion bill, that the governor did not sign into law. I supported his position on that because I think that with office, we need to take a longer term view of what, let's see how the pandemic and work from home shakes out over a 10, 20 year time frame. I think we shouldn't be super willing to jump in and make major changes, let's say converting office to housing before we really see what our office needs are going to be long-term. I, I think a, a healthy city community has housing, jobs, retail, open space, and all those things, which I think Walnut Creek does. I, I think that the state could be more of a partner, could look for opportunities to provide more amenities, more transit enhancements and improvements in office space, and take a broader view than just being focused on housing. We have economic challenges that transcend housing. Let's look at that same question from a perspective. And Mark Orcott from East Bay Leadership was on a couple of months ago and he hates that Contra Costa is called the bedroom community. Solano is often referred to as a bedroom community because most people leave for work. What you're talking about is that balance of jobs and living that people don't need to always commute to the cities or Silicon Valley. What do cities need to do to improve their permit process, improve their application to make it easier for businesses to come? I think the, the work has started on it. I wouldn't say it's done. It's, it's definitely a work in progress. I'm not here to say mission accomplished, but we've made some uh, good efforts in streamlining the design review process to make the design review commission in the city of Walnut Creek advisory to the planning commission or staff. We've eliminated these multiple rounds of hearings and back and forth between the different entities. We still want architects involved in the process and advising on the look and feel and livability of buildings, but let's do a, a one bite at the apple type rule and then move it forward to the planning commission or staff to get the approvals done. We, we've also um, made progress in terms of having this online portal so that plans can be submitted online. You can request a building inspection online. You don't have to go down to city hall or get somebody on the phone to do that. We have greater coordination among our, our economic development, community development, and public works departments in the city, all of which are separate departments, right? And if you're, if they're not functioning in an efficient way, they could be silos, but we've made this really concerted effort that you know, this, the street frontage improvements for a development project 
are going to need to be coordinated by public works, the building department and the planning department issuing the approvals, making sure all those departments are working in sync. And there, there's more work to be done. We're uh, working with the chamber on a technical advisory panel through the Urban Land Institute focused on the healthcare industry, which is one of Walnut Creek's strengths. How do we build on that strength and the high number of jobs we have in that industry? Blessed to have Kite Bull Kaiser and John Muir Health here, the Bass Cancer Center, a new cancer center with uh, John Muir and, and UCSF. How can we, through that study, get, a, get a further ideas in terms of potentially converting some older office space in the mid Ignacio Valley Road area to medical office and make that process, that, that would require some code changes, but make that process more streamlined and efficient. Yeah. And if the city has the desire to do that from a policy perspective and create that flex zoning to shift that office space, then brokers start looking at it. Oh, it's already done. Here's a place that makes it easy for you to come to. That's exactly right. And these brokers forums have we, that the city has uh, helped facilitate have been really helpful in hearing that feedback. Another one we've heard through the brokers forum is we need to make amendments to our sign ordinance because that's critical to tenants. Looking at Walnut Creek as an attractive place often comes up when we talk about economic development. Cities should have this concierge sort of role. What does that mean to you? More than a title, but, but what is that person and how can it help a city do economic development? I think it's a really interesting and, and useful kind of staff uh, position that I encourage and am supportive of uh, looking at hiring in a, in a single point of contact instead of an applicant having to chase down and do I talk to the city manager? Do I talk to the community development director? Do I talk to the public works director? Do I call a city council member? This is a single point of contact that someone would have whose sole job responsibility, I view it, would be to be a creative problem solver, to be a mediator to some extent when you have one department or one staff official taking a hard line on some things and seeing to what extent is there flexibility um, to address this problem in some other way. I think that role can be really uh, key and critical because it would be obvious and transparent to be on the website. You would know that this is the person, this is the fixer, and this is the person you go to that's going to pick up the phone when you call and have two or three ideas um, for solutions and follow up and make sure that they're going to be engaged until the, the problem or the issue is solved. But if everybody hires a concierge service, they wouldn't need my services anymore because people hire me as a consultant to call those 12 people for them. I, 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 that's a good point. Things are relatively complicated in terms of the entitlement and development process that I think there would still be roles for both of us. Going. Yeah, I, I agree. I just like to throw out occasionally what I do for work. So the listeners remember that. Yes. I think one of the biggest complaints I hear from businesses, particularly outside of housing is to what you talked about in that, right? Is that, Hey, I got to go to this department. I got to go to this department. Sometimes internally people are just waiting for one department to finish and then they start they start in the next department afterward and that causes delays when you talk to don burris from the city of vacaville their economic development director he says i bring in everybody in every department and we start with a 90-day clock who needs what at what time for us to approve any type of permit whatsoever I just like that because it's the bringing in everybody together. Fremont, when you ask them about why they're successful in roughly a 90 day period, they say the same thing. Any thoughts on that? I think those are both really intriguing ways that cities are doing what we're trying to do. I'm, I'm all for learning from other cities and people that are maybe doing things better than we are. I do think we need to lay the groundwork a little better to be in that position to have the 90 day type windows. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of do, doing a little more deep dive of our code to make sure that we're set up for success like that, that we've cleared the hurdles and the obstacles for things to go quickly. And once we've done that, I, I'm all in favor of an all, all hands meeting. Um, I think there's a lot to be said really for face-to-face -face meetings 
And even, I know we're doing this by Zoom, and I think that's been a great technology improvement too. When people sit down face-to-face, they're more vested in a resolution. They view that they, they took the time out of their day to attend, travel to, get come to this meeting, and they're coming with a, a solution-oriented approach. I'm intrigued by what these other cities are doing and would be fully supportive of exploring those and seeing how we can incorporate them in Walnut Creek. I was reading an article recently about the former city manager of Lafayette who was trying to bridge a gap on a housing project. He agreed and said, okay, everybody has to sit down. I'm going to have this meeting. And he put out grapes and cheese and some crackers because he said to negotiate your best if you break bread together. And he said to the other people, you have to eat a grape. I don't care, but I'm not talking to you until you eat a grape. And we become friends first. That's what you're talking about in that face-to-face is share that meal, get to know each other, understand where everybody's coming from. Sometimes that's hard to do. I'm not saying every meeting needs to be that one, but I think there are a few key critical ones that really benefit, like these 90-day meetings that, that are being done in, in Vacaville. I, I'm sure they're being done in a conference room at City Hall. I think those that's really key. And I like the idea of breaking bread together. I know I've been involved kind of as, as an attorney, oftentimes the app projects will require community meetings and have found that they tend to go better if there are refreshments provided. And especially if you can meet someone face-to-face, I think the tone and the approach is much different than it can be online or through email. Definitely. Let's talk about that community engagement process. More and more Cities have required for larger changes, developers, whether residential, housing, or commercial, to engage in a number of community meetings. What is the goal of that, and how does that help the process? I think it can be very helpful to the process. The community engagement process, ideally, allows for kind of an early, comprehensive vetting of issues, concerns early on that that can influence the decision-making. People can feel that they're more invested in being heard. And then by the time it gets to the city council level, it would have gone through several rounds of meetings already. Those key meetings really are those community meetings at the beginning. By the time it gets to the, the city council meet, meeting, we don't want it to be a situation where all those community concerns are just being raised essentially for the first time. We want them there to be an opportunity for them to be fully vetted by staff and our other commissioners with recommendations that come to the council. Talk a little bit along those lines about the public benefit packages. Cities have been really pushing for those because they want more for the community. Additions to parks, improvements to streets. But there's a lot of talk is that's driving up the price of construction. You've seen both sides as both an elected official and planning commissioner, but also as the lawyer representing the developers. Absolutely. I think being on both sides of this gives me a unique perspective, and I try to employ that perspective on whatever side I'm representing at the moment. We have adopted two major specific plans, the West Downtown Specific Plan and the North Downtown Specific Plan. Those are the areas in and around downtown near the BART station. We plan for the future of housing, office, and additional retail spaces. Those were huge benefits because we did that in advance of getting a new, higher uh, housing element number. We had already done a lot of hard work in terms of adopting these plans and planning for that housing in and around the area, near transit and the freeways, where we're not putting people further out and, and adding to the traffic issues there. As part of those plans, we adopted a community benefits program intended to be proportional um, in exchange for providing things like providing um, connections between areas near downtown and the BART station or near downtown, providing bike and pedestrian improvements beyond just the frontage of the project that the developer already has to do. In exchange for a developer committing to do things beyond what they're required to do by law, they get the potential for additional height or density or floor area ratio. That program was adopted in connection with those plans. It's not an automatic, but 
It's intended to be the carrot and stick, that if you do this, you get that. That's a, a codified program. It's based on a point basis. It's pretty transparent. The developer would know going in, if I do this, these are the benefits I would be entitled to. It's being employed now with a housing project at the DMV site. Uh, it's not required, but if the developer's greater density, it provides a community benefit. It seems proportional and fair. There are other instances um, outside of those two specific plan areas where we've looked at um, a situation when a developer has sought a general plan amendment, which is a, one of the most major changes you can make to some land use documents. So changing the land use designation from business park to residential, major change in the general plan. That's not what the general plan envisioned for a site. And in exchange for uh, granting approval to those types of major changes, we have asked developers to provide community benefits. And they tended to work out to be, I don't know if it's proportional, but the rule of thumb that we've used is about 1% of the project value it be provided in exchange as a community benefit is along the lines of the similar ones that are in our codified community benefits program, public transit improvements or uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements. We haven't had a ton of those. There was one in the Shadelands. Most of the benefit programs that we've talked about have been under that codified community benefit program in the North downtown, West downtown area. There's another at the Walnut Creek Toyota where they have agreed to provide additional affordable housing as a community benefit and to provide some key trail pedestrian improvements to connect that area to the BART station. So I, I see it as part of the, the land use entitlement situation going forward. I am not um, interested in now putting on my other hat. I mm -hmm. think it could be enlarged or extended in a way that I don't think is helpful. That if you were to say for any permit someone comes in for, you want a community benefit. I don't think that's fair or transparent or predictable. If the applicant is asking for a major change, like, like the general plan amendment or the rezoning, that should be part of the conversation. We give an opportunity for an applicant to come in early on through a gatekeeper process before seeking a major change like that and ask the council, is this something you would be receptive to? We can't approve it because it hasn't gone through the whole process and had an environmental review. But they're just asking at that very early stage, should we waste our time in going through that whole process? Usually as part of that hearing, we talk about public benefits. If this goes forward and gets approved, we'll be expecting some sort of public benefits. There is some heads up at a relatively early stage that would be sought for by the city uh, as part of the project. What I heard in that is a carrot and stick. You take a whole area that the city is focused on in terms of redevelopment, whether it be for housing or for commercial use, but just wants to make an improvement. And you say, okay, if you do this in this area, we will make your process easier, increase density or reduce parking because we're looking at a bigger picture economic development plan. I would just tell cities, really, you should be considering that in the process, develop a plan for a whole area instead of doing just one-off solutions, right? I see what you're saying. The feedback you're hearing is make it more codified, essentially like we've done in the downtown like, plans. Sounds like you've done a carrot and stick where you're giving them the carrot to say, hey, we want these bike paths. We want this improvement in green space. We'll give you something if you give us something, right? And make it easier for them to build. That's right. Let's talk about CUP and AUP. First, define for people, what is it and why one versus the other? And some of you already talked about related to the general plan, but I think that would be good to tackle. But a zoning ordinance, uh, which every city is required to have, and it has to be consistent with the general plan, sets forth various different zoning districts throughout town, residential, commercial, office, institutional, public areas, parks, things like that. In each zoning district, there will be a list of permitted uses and conditionally permitted uses. Permitted uses can go forward without special approvals from the city other than a building permit because they're 
permitted in that zone. Think on a pedestrian retail zoning district in Walnut Creek, most standalone retail is a permitted use. You don't need a special permit to do it. The zoning districts also include these lists of conditionally permitted uses. Conditionally permitted uses are ones that the city has gone through and said, these are special, unique uses that we want to give more thought or consideration to. You have to get approval of a conditional use permit from uh, generally the planning commission in the city. It can be appealed to the city council, but most conditional use permits are granted by the planning commission. And so that in, in this instance with pedestrian retail district, for instance, you would, most uh, restaurants that serve alcohol past 11 p.m. If you want to serve alcohol past 11 p.m., you'll need a conditional use permit because those uses we found from a policy standpoint can tax our police resources. They can lead to concerns if they're not, if the businesses aren't managed properly. We want to make sure going in that they need to get a special permit and that special permit will have conditions on how they can operate. An administrative use permit is a lesser conditional use permit. It's still a special permit, but generally those are ones that can be granted by staff. For instance, we had a, an applicant who was interested in doing a, a electric vehicle showroom in the pedestrian retail area where it's not necessarily identified as a permitted or conditionally permitted use. Looked at that, examined it, and determined it would need this kind of special permit. I don't believe it was an administrative use permit, but it, it was not a conditional use permit either. There's varying different levels of permits, and they generally require more time, more energy, more effort and more hearings before you get the approval to do what you're seeking to do. And from an economic development standpoint, how should that be looked at? If cities are looking to improve their code and make changes to attract more businesses to places in the greater East Bay, what are some lessons you've learned to improve that process? I think there's an opportunity to be very selective in terms of the uses that really do require that extra energy and effort and potentially a draw on city resources that we want to be careful about. And I primarily are only a handful of those types of uses that we have to be that concerned about that we need to require the special permit. For the vast majority of uses, there's an opportunity for us to re-examine them and say, is this something that can be allowed through a, a permitted use the building would still be reviewed under our streamlined design review process, but is it something we need to subject to this special permit process? And I didn't see any downside that it would have any noxious uses or tax resources. If anything, it would create the potential for a lot of sales tax revenue, which would be great for the city. In an area where we already have pedestrian retail, it's very consistent with our sustainability goals and the direction we're all going, especially in the state and hopefully in the country, kind of all electric, reducing our carbon footprint. It checked a lot of boxes. And I think for uses like that, we shouldn't be concerned. We should allow them to go down a more streamlined, permitted approach. Give staff the flexibility to work within it. Yeah, and that, that is a key part, Jared, because in going to other cities, I've seen instances where staff does not feel empowered to do their job and feel compelled to bring almost everything to the city council for fear they're getting out ahead of the city council or sticking their neck out in a way that's not politically uh, palatable. I don't view Walnut Creek that way at all. There's probably other ways we can improve it so that staff is even more empowered, but I'm in support of that. I think that the council, when it's functioning well and in a healthy manner, we're, we're essentially volunteers. We, we do get a stipend. I want to make that clear. It's essentially a volunteer role. The tasks and duties should be more high level in terms of providing policy uh, guidance and perspective, feedback from the community, certainly, because that's why we're elected to be representatives, but to let the day-to-day -day work be done by the 350 or more great people that work for the city of Walnut Creek. Let's lay out a case study where cities are limited, that you may not want something, but it's already zoned for that. What do cities do in that case? Uh, I know you've had a, a controversial in Walnut Creek recently. You could use that as a case study. 
or talk about it. Sometimes land use works against cities. Yes, you're right. There are instances where the the zoning and the planning allow a use, and we don't have discretion to say no to a project. That that's certainly becoming more and more of the case with housing projects. And I don't think these laws are directed at Walnut Creek because we've always been the type of place that has tried to do our job, plan for the future, and and recognize that we have an obligation not only for ourselves, but to our children, our grandchildren, to create a community where people can afford to live here. Everyone can afford to live here. We don't want just professionals living here. We want everyone to be able to afford to live here. I think we've tried to lay the groundwork for that. And there are certain instances where we don't have the discretion to say yes or no. And then what's interesting on that is, and I think one of the key lessons learned may be that there's a lot of importance that goes into considering and adopting zoning ordinances, a plan development ordinance, for instance, that might govern a shopping center. And when that's adopted and the plan development ordinance says a restaurant with takeout services is allowed, the city has made that policy decision in that zoning district and can't say no. If it did say no, it'd be at risk of acting in an arbitrary and discriminatory manner because it, it set forth the rules of what was going to be allowed in that zoning district. If an applicant comes forward with a use that's consistent with the uses that are allowed in that zoning district, the city doesn't have discretion to say no. It, it does have an obligation to make sure the impacts are addressed. But assuming it has the studies and has done the due diligence and the work and confirmed to the best of its knowledge that the impacts are being addressed, then the city doesn't really have the discretion to say no. Through careful planning and zoning and making sure we're not putting incompatible uses next to each other, we can resolve a, lo a lot of these issues and concerns. There, there will still be projects, though. We've, we've had a couple over the last few years. One was the restaurant project that you mentioned. One was a housing project that was technically in the county and approved by the county, but required a point of access through the city. There'll still be issues like that. And we'll continue to do the best we can to be as transparent and predictable, not only with the property owners and developers, but with the public. Anyone should have access to what the zoning rules are and to see online, okay, this is an allowed use. So it's the city ha does can't say no to it, essentially, and just has to make sure that the impacts are addressed. This will air just after the 2024 elections. What advice do you have for a new council person coming in, not just to Walnut Creek, but anywhere in the East Bay? What should they be looking at or what should they know regarding land use? Great question, especially for a new council member who maybe didn't come from a planning commission background. I, I think that I and several of my colleagues on the council did and had that advantage. We have others that came from transportation and arts and have that advantage. You know, the issues that you're dealing with are so broad that I would say come in with an open mind, be willing to learn. Someone, a former council member, Kish Rajan, explained it to me that serving on the council is like getting a PhD in municipal governance because there's so many things and factors in different parts of the community, city governance that you need to learn going in. And I would say, come in with an open mind, learn as much as you can that first year. It definitely will be drinking from a fire hose, even if you've been involved in the process before. And I highly encourage people to get involved in the process first before running for council, because I think it gives you a good framework and a base. You're set up for success if you have a good understanding of at least one part of the city before you ask for a promotion to the city council. You are one of five members, so you're more like Congress or the legislature, but at a much smaller scale. And those relationships that you have with your colleagues and with your city manager are critical to any success. Um, you would have on the council. We have an extremely, I would say, cohesive council now. We don't always view eye to eye on every issue, and I think that's healthy, but we do it in a respectful manner. There's no talking behind one another's back after the, uh, some vote or something like that. We do that sort of discussions in council before the public, and we do it in a, in a respectful manner, but recognizing that 
being one of five requires you to have good ideas, but also be able to convince the others on your panel that they're good ideas and that hopefully they're everyone's ideas, not just your ideas, and that you can all get behind them and try to make them a reality. I think that's a great tip and it just goes back to what you were talking about with an economic development team and different teams from the city. Meet in person, build a relationship, work towards solving problems together. Absolutely. Anything else I should be asking you before we head out? No, it's just been a, a real pleasure to be on today. Thank you for uh, asking me to participate. I've been watching your interviews online. I'm super impressed with the number of people you're reaching out to and the information that you're making available to the public. I am appreciative of the work that Capstone's done in the Shadelands Business Park in terms of helping us turn the corner and recreate and rebrand um, the park. It's really exciting what's happening out there. Thank you for the opportunity and, and the good work you're doing there and on our Transportation Commission. Matt Francois from the city of Walnut Creek. Thanks for being here. Wait, don't leave yet. Hit subscribe. Make sure you get the weekly updates. We have a new episode every Wednesday for stuff happening in the East Bay. In the meantime, follow me on LinkedIn, Jared Ash, or check out our firm where we have a weekly newsletter and blog at Capstone Government Affairs on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today on the Capstone Conversation.